and hear you all. It's such, so lovely, so lovely. All righty, let's see. Welcome, welcome to this day of this time, to this time of more light. Not quite more warmth, but there's the promise of it. So welcome to the promise of this day. As many of you know, I'm the volunteer chaplain with Palliative and Supportive Care on Nantucket, or PASCON. We recently lost someone that many of us on the team had known and loved for, for over six years. At the Zoom memorial, I followed the text that this person and I had written together for over a year before she died. She had sculptured her memorial, I'll call her Beth, as not only a way to feel honored and remembered, but as a way to say goodbye. I'd never done anything like this before, nor led a memorial where every word, piece of poetry, or music ch was chosen, considered, measured by the one we were memorializing. Every step was choreographed by her. Leading this memorial was a dance. During the memorial, someone lifted up this story. One of the PASCON volunteers who was very close to Beth really missed visiting her once she went to the hospital. So she worked with the nurses and they put a big X of blue tape on the window where, in the room where Beth lay. And the volunteer would go to the hospital parking lot with a big hat on her head with lights that turned on and off. And she and Beth would pick up the phone and chat, one behind a big blue X and the other under a flashing Christmas hat in the parking lot. Some say we die alone, perhaps. But on the way to the last breath, there is so much more than death that happens. Welcome to this Sunday, this time to love, grieve, witness, and celebrate one another, however and wherever we find ourselves. Welcome. Today I am honored to welcome our guest, Dr. B.J. Miller. B.J. is a longtime hospice and palliative medicine physician and educator. He has given over a hundred talks nationally and internationally on the topics of death, dying, palliative care, and the intersection of healthcare with design. His 2015 TED talk, Not Whether But How, aka What Matters Most at the End of Life, has been viewed over 11 million times, and his work has also been the subject of multiple interviews and podcasts, including Oprah Winfrey, PBS, The New York Times, The California Sunday Magazine, Goop, is that how I say it, BJ? Krista Tippett, Tim Ferriss, and the TED Radio Hour. His book, A Beginner Guide to the End, was co-authored with Shoshana Berger and published in 2019. I had read an article in the New York Times about New York Times about death and found the author, and I thought, I just love to learn from this man. And I found him on the website and asked him if he would speak here. And without hesitation and asking for no remuneration, he said, I'd be honored. So it is we who are so honored, BJ. Welcome. Um, would you like to say hello, BJ? You'll have to un unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you, Reverend. It is so lovely to be here, Linda. I really appreciate the invitation. And Hi, everybody out there. Uh, I'm in Mill Valley, California, on the other coast. Um, but it's a pleasure being with you guys. So thank you so much for welcoming me. And tell us all the name of your kitty. Oh, ah, well, this is the Muffin Man. There's <laughs> <laughs> Maisie, if you can see her back there. Oh, yes. We are a congregation of animal lovers. So you just got, you're in, BJ. Nothing else you got to say. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us. And before we go on, Joanne Polster had something she wished to say. Joanne, you'll have to unmute yourself, love. It's not so much an announcement as a plea. Um, we need some volunteers to help us do some final clearing up of the um, of the garden of the remembrance garden very appropriately for this particular sermon today um we need to take up a brick walk um, a stone walk 
and to remove a couple of uh, shrubs that uh, we decided need to be removed. The work would take about two hours. Um, we need some uh, willing and able hands. I think if we could have about four or five people, we should be able to do the work in that time. Um, the time would be Saturday um, at 10, 10, to, 10 to 12, probably. Uh, to do the brick wall, to do the stone walk, we would need, you'd have to bring crowbar or tire iron. Um, for the um, taking, if taking up of the bushes, we would need shovels, axes, uh, that pickaxe is um, maybe a, an equipment like that, um, troweled. Um, I would like any of you who would like to work with us. Nancy and I can't do it all by ourselves. We really need your help. Um, if you would leave your name and phone number in the chat, we would get in touch with you just in case there's a cancellation because of the weather. Um, four or five people I think would really do the trick and you won't be very close to each other. So there is that safety margin. Thank you, Joanne. And before we go on, I think we have a few birthdays too to celebrate this morning. Suze Robinson and Dennis Simmons have recently had birthdays. Am I missing anyone? Is there anyone else who had a birthday in the last week? Lydia Sussex, all right. Who else? Anybody else um, that I'm missing? Then let us have a rousing birthday to Dennis, Suze, Lydia. Dennis, Suze, and Lydia. Okay, here we go. I know that twice, but that's okay. And before we go on to the challenge, uh, Paul has a, has a quick announcement. I hope everybody's gotten the call to the special congregational meeting next Sunday, uh, where we will vote on a 2021 budget. And this Sunday, in one of the breakout rooms, I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has about that proposed budget. Um, just ask Sue if to be in my breakout room and we can talk about financial stuff. If you want to talk about fun stuff, you can be in one of the other breakout rooms. <laughs> Thank you. So just put your name there in the chat if you haven't already emailed Elizabeth, um, if you would like to be in Paul's generous offer to go through budget um, details, so important to all of us. All right, my dears, we're going to light that chalice now. So if you don't know the words, they are with this flame. We renew our commitment to justice, peace, and compassion. And Gary will lead the way. Gary's having trouble. <laughs> Gary's having trouble, but any second now. <laughs> With this flame, we renew our commitment, justice, justice, peace, and compassion. And now we'll stay unmuted for the singing of the affirmation, which can also be printed in, can be found printed in your order of service. Folks got some harmony in there. At the end. That was nice. <laughs> it is the time in our service where we greet one another.
But if you are new today or returning mm -hmm. after a long hiatus, we would love for you to remind us or tell us your name and where you're zooming in from so that we can greet you with our big open UU hearts. Invitation only, of course, but just raise your hand in your screen or, or um, in the reaction button, you can raise a virtual hand and, or just unmute yourselves and speak right on up. Anyone today? Okay then, my dears, am I missing anyone? I don't think so. Then let us take a moment now and greet one another. Just unmute yourselves and say hello. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi, Dennis. Happy Hi, birthday. Hi, Dennis. Happy Hi, birthday. Thank you. Yeah, Dennis. Happy birthday. Lydia, Lydia, when's your birthday? March 3rd. Oh, oh, mine's March 4th. Oh, happy belated. <laughs> When's yours, Dennis? March 4th. It was uh, last Monday. Oh, okay. That's happy my birthday. birthday. Uh, hi, hi Gabrielle. Hey. Hi, Polly. Good morning. Hi, Nigel. Hey, Tucker. Nice to see you. Thank you. Nice to see you, Susan. Hi, Nigel. Wow. Hi, Dad. I miss you, Dad. Hi, Dad. Hi, Dad. I was on mute. Hi. Hi, Randy. Oh, good, Dennis, to see you looking up right now. Hi, Alison. Hi, Allison. Hi, Allison. Hi, Polly. Hi, Lucre. Hi, Holly. Hey, Holly. Hi, Holly. Hi, Peter. Hi, Susan. Hi. Which one? Hi, 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 Plank. Judy and Michael. Oh, oh, Susan, Susan. Oh. <laughs> hey, I love your magazine picture, yeah, your uh, I and M pictures. Good morning, Carol. They were Good cool. morning. Thank you very much. All right, my dears. Um, uh, we are. Oh, it's up to you, Nigel. That's right. It's time for our first hymn. Uh, this is number 38, Morning Has Broken, and I will uh, remind everybody that we do stay muted for the singing of the hymns. These are recorded by myself and the choir during the week to make it sound like all of us are singing together, even though we're all in separate spaces. And I'll just encourage everybody to sing along in your own space, even though we can't sing together um, when we sing all at the same time. We are connected through the rhythm, and if you sway, you'll be swaying with everybody else, all in different spaces. And when we breathe at the end of the phrases, we'll be breathing all together. So this is Morning Has Broken, number 38, and you can find the lyrics attached to the order of service. Dear Nigel and Choir, how you keep our hearts beating <laughs> through 
through all of this, you are our heartbeat. Thank you so much for your gifts that you give so generously. And Susan Fernald now has Susan Fernald now has a poem to read for us. Oops. Technical. Oh Christ! I almost left the meeting. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness! I forget how to get out of here to the thing. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, Susan. Um, Take your time. We've got time. <laughs> when death comes, by Mary Oliver. When death comes like the hungry bear in autumn, when death comes and takes all the bright coins from his purse to buy me and snaps the purse shut, when death comes like the measle pox, when death comes like an iceberg between the shoulder blades, I want to step through the door full of curiosity, wondering what is it going to be like that cottage of darkness? And therefore I look upon everything as a brotherhood and a sisterhood and I look upon time as no more than an idea. And I consider eternity as another possibility. And I think of each life as a flower, as common as a field daisy and as singular. And each name, a comfortable music in the mouth, tending as all music does towards silence. And each body, a lion of courage and something precious to the earth. When it's over, I want to say all my life, I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I have made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. Thank you so much, Susan. Beautifully done. Thank you. I pray that's how Mary Oliver found death, huh? I pray that we can all find death in this way when it is our turn. Beautiful words. Please join me now for a moment of reflection and meditation. Take a breath first. Just put your feet on the ground. Put anything distracting you away just for a moment and allow this time, this sweetness, this hour of sweetness among us to fill you up for the week to come. Sweet March wind, full of promise, full of remembering, full of longing, grant us the grace to lift our eyes and chests and minds into the place between our skin and bones, in between our minds and hearts, in between what we know and what we fear, and venture into liminal time, where what is real and unreal blur, where what is known and unknown dance, where we are and are not. Grant us the courage to dream, to love, to remember, Remind us of what matters, love, forgiveness, presence, openness to each other, each impossibly vulnerable moment. In all the beautiful, frightening mystery of life, help us walk the places where feet touch earth anew, where mind meets the unknown without a translator, where heart leaps, where hearts leap and feel what they cannot predict, help us invite life in, all of it, so that we may love and be fully loved. Amen. It is the time in our service now for joys and concerns. And we ask that the joy, spoken and unspoken, grow more bountiful because held here together in this spirit and the burdens, spoken and unspoken, grow easier to carry because carried by all of these hands. Bless you all. And Nigel? And that
that brings us to our middle hymn. This month we'll be singing number 18, Wondrous Love. And I've had a bit of fun reimagining this hymn. This is an old um, early American hymn originally found in the Southern Hymnal. Um, very thick shape note harmonies. And I've completely reimagined it. Um, I've had this arrangement in my mind for many years, and this uh, the technology here at our disposal has allowed me to realize it. was awesome. I loved it. Thank you. Thank you. So uplifting. <laughs> Tucker's happy. I see his thumbs up. <laughs> All right, my dears. Now settle down and enjoy this beautiful human being who will speak to us. You are up, BJ, if you could unmute yourself. And please. All right. <clears throat> well, beautiful, guys. Uh, I'm already in a better mood. I'm a little earlier than the rest of you, three hours in the past out here. Um, and that music just really went through my soul. Thank you. Um, so I guess uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about grief. It's almost for me, it's taken on, that subject has taken on almost like a, um, a public service. I feel I want to sort of scream about grief from the treetops. Um, because it's a precious opportunity, as painful as it is. Um, let me back, back, back up a little bit. So I, my work nowadays is much on Zoom with my patients. And recently, I was talking to Barbara, one of my longtime patients. I now, we now call them clients because I see folks in this way that's outside of medicine, outside of the medical model. So I should say my client, Barbara, and we were talking about this period and all the upheaval and the unrest and the pain and the uncertainty. And she leaned into the camera and we were lamenting, of course, there was much to lament, but she moment, she leaned in the camera and she had this little twinkle in her eye and she said, I'm so, and she whispered it because I suppose there would be some embarrassment if she, someone heard her say this, but she said, I'm so grateful for this pandemic. And I said, why, Barbara? And she said, well, <clears throat> now my friends who have wondered how to support me, I've been living with stage four cancer now for years. And now my friends who have sort of 
fumbled with themselves trying to figure out how to be kind to me, what to say to me. Well, now, now they know. Now they know what it's like to live with uncertainty. And now they know what it's like to live with loss. And they're just a little bit closer to me now. And that's making a huge difference. She said, I feel seen, I feel heard. I don't feel so alone. And it almost brought a tear to my eye. I was so happy to hear her say that. Not happy for the pandemic, of course, but like all things bigger than ourselves, there's something, there's, there's things for us to learn. And I think of Barbara's story now, um, both as a way to stay in tune with what we can appreciate. You know, I, like many of us, I'm, I'm very good at appreciating something after I've lost it. And I almost feel like my goal in life, whatever years I have, whatever how many days I have left on this planet, would be for me to learn to appreciate what I have while I still have it, to not need to lose it, to realize how much I love it. And in that, to do so, I, I have taken, well, I have come to appreciate grief as this metabolic process that allows me to do that. And I'll get to that in a second, but there's another thing going on right now, which is, you know, spring is around the bend. Uh, buds are appearing on the trees. My mood is lifting. I can feel it. And meanwhile, thanks to vaccination programs, we are hearing about, you know, that the end of the pandemic may be near and we're hearing more and more about this phrase, return to normal, you know, as though, as though we can go back. And I get it. I mean, I think there is a, certainly there's something for us to recapture uh, in our daily lives as the country opens back up when it does. But I hope we'll pause too before lurching backwards uh, and not treat this year of unrest as, a, as an anomaly, but rather pause with it, live with it for a second and ask ourselves, first of all, can, can we go back to where we were? And if you're really honest, um, would you want to? Would you want to go back? Um, I'm not sure I would. Uh, as crises do, they're, we're, they're, we're being revealed. Our shortcomings, our half-truths, the sort of lazy thinking, momentum stopped and allowed us to see a little bit more clearly. And as I work with families through grief, there's this period where everyone is super tenderized, where you can still feel the loss in the air and you can still, and you can begin to see sort of the clouds parting. You can hold both, that there's this sweet vulnerable, but sweet vulnerability. And then I watch as the months go by and those families sort of re-enter the world per se, re-enter that reality of daily life, reality in quotes, I suppose. And I watch the old habits come back and I watch the old thinkings come in and the ego set back up. And that window, that tenderness can close. Almost feels like an adaptive response. Like I can't be this, I can't be this tender and be out in the world. That would hurt too much. Okay. I mean, this is not a sadistic pursuit. I don't, I'm not interested in pain for its own sake. But pain is often trying to tell us something. So I guess... Part of my point here would be to, to watch ourselves when we say going back or returning to normal and let ourselves savor this moment where we actually feel so much more as uncomfortable as it can be, you know? And so this now circles me around to this muscle called grief. How do we, you know, how do we become how do we stay true to what's gone? How do we honor what's gone while also noting what's, what remains? How do we do that? Well, human beings were given this talent and I has come, I've come to see it as a talent of grieving. It's almost like a metabolic process. It's almost like a, it's almost like a climate. 
you know, it's an altered state when we're in grief. And the world looks different. Um, and in a way, what I think is happening is our constructs of reality, of ourselves in the world, are being shaken. And our relationship to the past and our relationship to the future and the present all come together. And of course, we feel drunk with that. It's very hard to hold everything at once. It's very hard to feel everything at once. And so, so grief is hard. But if I think if we see it as a, a metabolism, a process, a transition, that grief is healing. Healing may, can be uncomfortable. And you guys all probably know this. I don't need to lecture you on the power of grief or the importance of grief, probably. Although maybe we do. Maybe we do need to remind each other. Um, maybe grief does point us to bigger truths, to bigger realities that need our attention before we reduce our worlds again and make them livable and actionable and predictable. I, I came around to the, the muscle of grief, the power of the muscle of grief um, in a negative way, sort of. I mean, years ago, and this has been up for me lately, because, you know, loss can beget loss. New losses open up old scabs. And I, it used to bother me a lot. I thought, gosh, I've gone through a lot of things. I've had some pain in my life. This should get easier. But each loss brought up all those pain, all that pain again. And I realized that I wasn't, my job was not to keep pain out of my life. That would be the same thing as keeping life out of life in so many ways. My job was to grow my capacity to sit with pain and sit with things I couldn't change. That took me a while to figure out. And I, it took me a while to figure out because I shut it down. My sister died now 20 years ago. And my response was, and by her own hand. So it was very tricky. But my response was for all that pain to shut it down. I took pictures away off my wall of her. I tried to remove the cues because the cues were just filled with torture, pain, torment. And I realized after a few years of that, I couldn't, I couldn't access the memory of my sister. I couldn't, when I tried to summon her, it was like a black wall. And I had done that. I was the one who had shut off. And I realized those painful moments were, were these tender connections that I still had in me. I was still connected to Lisa if I wanted to be. It just required being uncomfortable for a moment. And so I circled back and years later reopened that chest of grief. And I let myself have those feelings. And you know what happened is, of course, I let myself, I let my sister back into my life. And in this way, I came to see grief as this powerful connecting force. Even when something's gone, is it really gone? You know, like, I think my last point on, on all of this is the sort of invention that is closure. I've come to appreciate closure. Uh, it's a lovely invention. You know, it's very, feels nice, beginning, middle, and end, it's tidy. But uh, I think it's really important that we remind each other that closure is something that we create. I'm not sure there's a natural closure. I think what we're realizing that life and death are not at odds, but they cohabitate. They prove each other. They need each other. And we don't get, we don't get one without the other. This life is a package deal and it requires sorrow and it requires pain and it requires joy. All of the above, you know, in this period where we're reimagining inclusion, um, yes, we need to look outside ourselves and include others. You guys know this very well. But I also think we need to look inside and include other parts of ourselves. You know, lead a less divided life, hold our losses and our gains, hold our lives and our deaths in, in, in one hand. They go together, that is the reality. Anything less than that is us making life smaller than it needs to be, even if that makes it a little more tolerable in the moment. So I guess if we give each other the space to grieve, give each other the time for it, to move through it, to move with it, I think what, what's waiting for us is a fuller, richer life, 
some much needed change in how we function in the world. And my favorite little piece is it comes with a wink, you know, it comes with a little glimmer in the eye that old wise folks have who have lost so much. And you can see them still standing with their wrinkles and they've got this little look in their eye that makes you know that they know something. And I've talked to a lot of wise people in my job. And what they tend to know is this with this, again, with the smiles, like we're saying right now, the death, life, it's all part of the same deal. And you have to love it. You can't love part of it. What's a partial love? You've got to love all of it. So anyway, I hope we'll encourage each other to grieve, to let ourselves feel all that messiness, the reality of it, the truth of it. And maybe we'll all come to, to gain the power of that little glimmer, that twinkle in the eye that says we know. So guys, that's, that's the end of my little rambling. Um, but I wanna thank you all for having me. I feel among friends we've never met. And here we are sharing computer screen and sharing space and time together. Uh, and that makes me very happy. I am not alone in this world, thanks to you. So um, all of my love, guys, it's been wonderful being with you. And we'll stick around a little bit longer. But back over to you, Rev. Uh, thank you so much, PJ. It was so heart opening, so grounding. Thank you so much for the simple truth. Sometimes it's so hard to remember them, to embrace them, and especially to embody them. Yes, I know you'll be doing a um, question and answer afterwards. I'm so grateful, too, for you for giving your time. If people have questions for BJ that have come up, put them in the chat, and I'll read them during the question and answer after the postlude. It falls to me to do the call to offering. And something you said, BJ, we are still connected if we want to be, if we have the courage to feel the pain, really touched me. I, I think I, <laughs> I protect myself from that. And we talk so much about connection, what it means. And um, we think of ourselves as a connected people. And of course, in this connection, we also suffer, don't we? Someone says something that hurts our feelings or we don't all agree on the board or something goes wonky and we have a disagreement or an argument or we feel slighted or overworked or oh my goodness there's so many options <laughs> and in those moments i think we withdraw and so the invitation to not withdraw but to lean in in those moments of discomfort and feel what they have to teach us thank you for that reminder bj very much and this community, in this call to offering, needs all of you. <laughs> your beauty and your suffering and your commitment and also uh, 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 your generosity in resources as well. Because you are how we stay going. There is no diocese or Holy Mother Church. You are the Holy Mother Church. <laughs> so please, I call you to this time of generosity. Over to you, Sue. Okay, so if you go and visit UnitarianChurchNantucket.org, at the top of the screen, you'll find the contribute button. Um, but I also want to point out, if you don't get our emails, you can click receive updates and fill out that form. And if you scroll down, um, there's still instructions on how to make your pledge for 2021. Uh, and there's a step-by-step -step video guide as well as a uh, document that you could print out and follow along with. And then at the bottom of the page, there's the PayPal link. Um, but if you click the contribute button, it brings you over to Tithely and you can choose Sunday offering pledge or a gift um, that you could make a memorial gift or a celebratory gift. You fill in the amount, you choose if it's recurring or not and all the uh, information, your name, your credit card, and then um, if it is a gift for in celebration or in memory of someone, you put in a note to let us know that. And then you would put in your card number and click give, simple as that. 
um, I think that's it. I'm going to put the address in case you want to send a check in the chat box, and I am going to turn it over to Nigel, who has something special for us today. Yeah, the offering today is uh, a movement from a sonato, sonata for violin by um, a man named Henry Eccles. And our final hymn today is number six, Just As Long As I Have Breath. Yes, to love is a 
I love that song. Tell them I said yes. Mm -hmm. May we learn to say yes, my dear ones, to all of it, to all of life, remembering that it all teaches, even as it breaks, breaks our hearts. And from the broken hearts, may we learn a deeper truth, a deeper miracle in this blessing of life and loss that we live together. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Nigel, for that offertory. If um, BJ had played what he said, I think it would have been that piece so beautifully matched. Nigel, you are such a blessing to us all, as you all are. Thank you for the blessings you are every day, every breath. And we will now blow out the chalice. The words are, carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again, and Gary will lead us. Carry the flame, the flame of peace, of peace and, and love until we meet, until we meet again. 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 And I have one. Oh, there we go. And now I have one last piece of music for you guys. Um, they all come bang, bang, bang at the end of the service. This is, yes. this is Dance by Bela Bartok. Thank you, Nigel, for that upbeat ending. <laughs> Thank you so much, my dear. Thank you all. Thank you, Sue Mintonin, for leading and guiding the way and holding the container with such grace. Thank you, choir. Thank you, BJ and Nigel and everyone here today. Thank you so much. And before we go into the um, talk about with uh, the Q&A with BJ, Sue has a reminder. Uh, hi, everyone. I've gotten some messages, but if you want to go into the special budget discussion chat room led by Paul Stewart after the talk about, uh, just slip me a little message in the chat and I will make sure to put you in that group. Thank you. All right, my dears. Um... If you have anything. Oh, yes, we do have a question, BJ. Um, from the Richards about um, they were impressed with your pets <laughs> and how they loved you and you loved them. And the question is, do you have any thoughts on how we learn from animals in terms of grief and living our lives? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Uh, absolutely. Uh, these, these guys are my little teachers. Uh, specifically, I watch them not doubt themselves they feel what they feel they do what they do they i don't see them spending a lot of time wishing they were some other critter or in some other place at some other time i suppose the way of putting it is that they are in the moment or they are present um, and if we're supposed to be the higher animal well we should at least be able to do what they can do but I guess I would question that higher animal thing anyway in the first place. But, but in answer to your question, absolutely. And I think in a word, what they help me do is not, is to just ha have my feelings and not wish them away and not spend time wishing I were somebody else. Um, in a way, I suppose they help me not be ashamed. There's a funny thing we humans do. We, we have to feel bad, whether it's depression or anxiety or pain or whatever it is, we feel bad and then we feel bad for feeling bad, you know, like as about some personal failing. I watch this happen a lot around grief with people who just struggle to stay sad. Um, sadness is somehow intolerable, so they'll turn the gun on themselves. They'd rather, in some level, it's easier for us to hate ourselves than to just be sad. So, uh, 
Circling back to your good question, yes, my animals teach me all sorts of things. To quit wishing I were somebody else, to quit wishing I had a different life, and to delight in this one that I have, to pay attention to this one I have, and to not be ashamed of my feelings, to be present with myself, my whole self. So yes, and I, after my injuries, I was injured in college uh, 30 years ago, lost some limbs. And uh, my godmother gifted me a service dog and I had him for 11 years for the rest of college and then through medical school. And he was, we were together 24 hours a day. And this lesson began with him. He looked at me, he didn't look at me as I was an incomplete person missing three limbs. I was, I was complete to him. He loved me in a way until I could love myself, something like that. But anyway, I could go on and on about my relationship to animals or our relationship to animals or our, the animal in us, I suppose is another way of putting it. But you know, so thank you for that prompt. I, I, I really enjoy giving my animals a lot of credit. They deserve it. <laughs> Thank you, BJ. You made a lot of people very happy with that answer. <laughs> um, I have a question for you about grief and this so-called closure. Thank you for saying that to me. People say I need the memorial service for closure and afterwards I don't feel closure and I think, oh goodness, um, how can one ever feel closure about the loss of someone we love? But my question to you is, how are you finding that grief is changing during COVID? Um, uh, people, I've had two Zoom memorials, um, so not able to touch or see, or even sometimes uh, visit the person who is dying in the hospital. Mm -hmm. How are you finding that this is changing grief? Well, for one, it's introducing a lot of people to grief. I think one way and another, we find our way. I mean, if you just look at the medical model, we're supposed to have about two weeks to grieve and then we're supposed to pick ourselves back up and go back out in the world, which is crazy talk. So I think one answer to your question is it's introducing us to the power of grief. You know, it's helpful in a way to be overwhelmed. And we can choose grief or it can come by force. And for a lot of us, it's coming by force and that's hard but it's also bringing the lessons with it too. So one answer to your question is it's simply introducing us to, to grief in a bigger way. But more directly to your question, Linda, you know, I, especially with some encouragement, I think I see it in my clients and people I work with, that what's happening is it's pointing them back inward. So it may be unable to visit with each other in the ways that we love in the analog aesthetic way of touching each other. And that may be cut off. Um, services, memorials have changed. Um, and yes, there's yet another loss to feel amidst the loss, you know, so own that and see what we still have. We still have this. There are things like reimagine end of life, which a group is putting on vigils, online vigils and grief vigils. Um, um, but ultimately what I love about this period, absent all these external cues, what's happening is a lot of us are going inward and here again perhaps for the first time to some degree so scary hard but in a way it makes the point that there is no rudder for grief you there is no external thing to go master um it is in you and so the attention should go in so many ways should go inward especially around the people that i've just lost well, they're gone from the planet in some way, but they're still in me in some real ways, like I was saying with my sister. So if, what I get, what I, what's hard, but also where I get um, excited is that people are developing a richer inner life. And that's where so much of the action is. That's where our relationships live, et cetera. So that's been lovely. Then one last message to, to on this question, Linda, like uh, I have a good friend, Mary Remington, who's a chaplain, a powder care chaplain on the East Coast, does work like you. And she was spent a lot of time in the hospital um, talking with families who uh, couldn't come see their loved one who was dying or who did. The hospital had a policy where people would come in for five minutes. If someone was dying, uh, one person from the family could come in for five minutes. And she watched as those people who were the lucky ones in a way who got to come see a person. And she watched how it actually seemed to make the pain worse. 
you know, everyone's gowned up and every the foreign, there's just all this stuff going on and there's no support in the room for them. And they're left alone and trying to say goodbye, trying to find closure in five minutes, which is impossible. And she watched how the folks, the families who did better were families who didn't come in and protected those final images of their loved one, but instead worked through Mary, the chaplain and said, Mary would ask them, tell me a little bit about your loved one. And then Mary would go like a love ambassador. She would go to their door stand in the window, look at the person, love at them. And in a way she became part of this sort of human chain. So I guess another lesson here is, so yes, go inward. And also the humbling part of grief is we realize, gosh, we can't do any, we don't do anything alone. You know, that we need each other. And that's not a problem in our independent, happy life. That's kind of an opportunity. And so working through others, linking through others like Mary the Chaplain, she became this human love link. And then it was a bond for that family with Mary. And then they could picture Mary loving their, their loved one and it worked so beautifully. So anyway, those are some responses, uh, some things that have come up, Linda, in answer to the question in response to COVID. But I don't wanna poly, I don't wanna be clear. I mean, it is hard. This, this is a real loss, not being able to see and touch each other. And I, I kind of want to hold that piece because I also, I don't want to lose the majesty of what it's actually like to touch another human being, mm. to smell another human being. I don't want to explain that away. I don't want to say, oh, well, Zoom is cool. We can, you know, it's good enough. No, no, I want to preserve that, the majesty of the, of the aesthetic plane so that we can revisit it with fresh eyes and love it uh, and not be convinced that we could do, a, we could have a virtual life through and through. I don't, I don't, I don't think that, I don't think so.